so this is the, uh, uh, the seventh in the series. It's uh, looking at replication and functional studies. It's basically answering, uh, we hope, the question that Kang asked yesterday. You know, okay, you find your genome-wide association, then what? Um, so we'll talk about replication uh, and also then about uh, sort of find how you find the potentially causal variant in neighboring regions. There are various approaches in sequencing that I won't go into in great detail, um, looking at uh, associations with protein products, expression studies, and experimental studies. Uh, and you've seen this by now many, many times. You can, you can see that we're quite enamored with it, and it, and it really did um, uh, sort of come, come to us as, as being probably the main way that one is sure that genome-wide association studies are, are robust. Um, one of the reasons we put this working group together um, uh, back in the fall of, new, of 2006 is that we, we recognized there really was a lot of disagreement as to what truly constituted replication. Uh, we knew that there was an avalanche of, of genome-wide studies that were sort of on the horizon at that point. Uh, certainly candidate gene studies had had tremendous problems with this. Replication was held to be kind of the sine qua non of, of a true association. And we knew that any single study would have difficulty uh, establishing an association until the sample size has got to be reasonably large. And of course, Easton and other studies, when they went into 25,000 and 50,000 cases and controls in that, probably are up there in terms of sample sizes, but uh, initial studies had trouble. And uh, how to interpret sort of confusing and, and uh, spurious, potentially spurious findings. And one of the cases in point that was used as, as, as an, a good example of this problem was the DTNBP um, gene and associations with schizophrenia. It had first been a, identified as a putative schizophrenia susceptibility gene in a group of Irish families um, a few years ago. And then there was confirmation reported in several replication studies and in independent European samples. But it was sort of different risk alleles, different haplotypes, sometimes different directions between studies. And the comparison was difficult because um, different studies had used different marker sets and, and uh, uh, variants to, to genotype. Um, what was done in, in this uh, study by the, the Broad Group, Mitsudi et al., uh, they basically took the HapMap data and, and used it to, with all of the polymorphism in this area to sort of identify and, and link together all of the variants that had been tested in these various studies uh, to produce sort of a high-density reference map of this particular region uh, of this gene uh, and identified five different uh, haplotypes of this particular gene. Um, that were tagged by these uh, six SNPs, shown here is the ancestral haplotype, and there, is, there are ways of clustering these that you can kind of go back and see, and determine which one was ancestral, and I won't go into those. Um, and then they had this kind of neighbor joining tree that basically showed, okay, if you changed in your 11 position, the A to the T, you ended up with um, uh, this particular um, haplotype. Um, from this ancestral one. If you then went forward and changed in the number three position, the G to an A, you ended up with this haplotype with the T there. And here, if you change the G to an A and a C to a T, you end up with these two um, uh, haplotypes. What was interesting was that in the study, uh, in this, the various studies that had looked at this locus, they sort of each looked at a different thing. So in, in green is this Kirov study here. Um, they looked at haplotype two, um, and I'm uh, sorry, at, uh, at SNP2, which tagged these two haplotypes. You can see sorry, these four haplotypes seen in green here. Um, and this study in red just looked at the, at the T variant. Uh, this study here in kind of brownish looked at these two, and the purple ones looked at different ones. And so basically each one was tagged by association signal for at least one study, but implying that there wasn't one common variant that contributed to schizophrenia uh, risk. And in many instances, some of these associations were in different direction, the opposite direction from what you would expect based on the, the, um, SNP rela the linkage relationships between these, suggesting to many people that these were either spurious findings or that there was a lot more to this locus than you might, you know, might expect at first glance, and, and we really needed to know a lot more about it. Um, so with this example and examples like it, we, we sort of agreed that we'd, um, you know, there were certain ways not to do a replication study, or which had been used in, in these various studies. Uh, if you want to use a different phenotype, that's a, a good way to not get a replication, use different markers. Next, what we refer to as fine mapping and replication. So fine mapping is, is at least for our definition, uh, is when you add markers that weren't on your previous, your, your initial genotyping platform. Um, duplication is you take exactly those same markers and, and, and type them. But in, a, in fine mapping, you actually add markers in between because you want to learn more about the haplotype structure there. Uh, using different analytic methods, some studies use haplotype methods, some use single marker uh, methods. You may or may not get replication in that approach. They use different models, um, different genetic models, different analytic methods, et cetera, or different populations. So all of these are sort of ways to not get a replication. 
Um, but in, in addition, uh, there, you know, there may truly be spurious findings that you, you want to get rid of. Um, this is an, an example here, the PDE4D phosphodiesterase, um, <clears throat> where um, it was initially reported as being associated with stroke in, in one, by the decode group, and then two subsequent studies did not find an association and a, a, a uh, meta-analysis of these studies did not find an association, and, and this was published in, in Nature Genetics uh, to their credit, which had published the original study, and the original authors then wrote back and said, you know, you're probably right, it probably was spurious, but it looked good when we first, when we first did it. Um, another um, good example, I think, of, uh, of a potentially spurious finding is this initial report from the Framingham group um, looking at a, a common genetic variant associated with adult and childhood obesity. Uh, this is by Alan Herbert being the first author. Um, and reported an association between the minor allele of this SNP6605 near INSIG2, which is a, a gene that seemed to have some biologic plausibility for, for um, obesity, and increased BMI um, in Framingham Heart Study participants. It was reproduced in four additional cohorts, but in a fifth cohort in, reported in this paper, which was the Nurses Health Study, it was not seen in that group. Then there were four subsequent um, uh, re replication attempts that found no support. Uh, this Roscoff study, the gene did not exhibit a significant increased risk for diabetes, and in fact, um, what, what it did increase was the risk for obesity in already overweight individuals, if you just look at that subgroup. Um, and then the, the loose study found no evidence of association here, and actually an opposite tendency, uh, all suggesting that perhaps this was not a, a terribly robust finding initially. To, to their credit, many of the folks who had been involved in this study initially, and you see their, their names highlighted here, then went back and tried to um, uh, look at why this might be. And, and I think one of the things we need to, to recognize about lack of replication is that it may be telling us something important scientifically that we'd like to learn about. So what they did was to look at nine more large cohorts from eight populations, multiple ethnicities. They had multiple designs, family-based, population-based, case control designs. Um, and they found an association in five cohorts, but there was no association in three cohorts. They also found a variability in the strength of the association over time, that's over calendar time, um, suggesting, and we know that there have been major uh, cohort effects in, in obesity, and so, so that might be some reason for that. Uh, and they found replication weekly, though, in unrelated as well as family-based samples. And they felt, again, you know, there's, there's probably something here, um, but it seems to be heterogeneous and we need to learn more about it. Uh, the same group um, then just very recently published this paper looking at timing of, uh, of uh, these analyses. Uh, timing can be everything. And what they, they did was to look at age-varying associations and ask the question um, whether some of these, these um, associations they were seeing differed by the age of the participants and there might be variants that are associated in childhood but not in adulthood and vice versa. Um, and they note that it's difficult for cross-sectional study designs to detect these kinds of things. Uh, so they identified a, a variant intronic to uh, the gene Robo1 um, that did have an age-varying association to BMI over time that was associated with BMI um, before age 45, but really actually really before age 30, but then diminished um, after age 45. Uh, and they were able to replicate this, the fact that the, the association varied by age in the same direction in five of eight other cohorts, um, and then that didn't have power probably for the others. And one childhood cohort showed a very strong association overall, and, and here's the, the four other um, uh, cohorts. This one was really driving the thing. They did end up with an overall uh, p-value that was quite strong as well. Um, and uh, they note that in all of their replication cohorts but one, the association would not have been detected if they were looking only for the main genetic effect and not for the age by uh, with the SNP here 5832 interaction, which is interesting. Um, when people have been looking for interactions, they've, they've sort of focused on those that have main effects and then go forward, recognizing that they're probably going to miss some of the false negatives that have no effect when you look at it without accounting for the, the heterogeneity, but do when you account for it. And again, this was adds to the complexity of the work uh, that one needs to do. So um, one of the, the things that came out of our, our working group were sort of definitions of a robust initial finding. Uh, what is it that would give you confidence and so that when these things come across your desk in, in terms of being good uh, genome-wide association studies, you'd like them to have sufficient statistical power to observe the reported effect. Um, and that may obviously will ma vary by the magnitude of the observed effect. So you'd want them to have sufficient power to pick up a 1.5, and if they picked up a 4, maybe that was spurious. 
um, the analysis should be highly significant, and we kind of decline to say how significant. But it should be using sort of a stable, well-accepted method. It shouldn't be just, you know, the only people that can replicate this are the people who, you know, use their particular method of, of analysis. The findings should be using a simple, straightforward analytic approach so that you, you don't get the feeling that they sort of looked at it in a simple, straightforward way and said, well, we don't find, find anything, so let's try a recessive model, which is not the first thing that people usually jump to, and then that didn't work, well, let's try a stratified model, that didn't work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they, there should be consistent found findings in a study that is more epidemiologically sound than some of the ones that we heard about previously. Uh, the findings should be consistent overall and within key subgroups and uh, 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 consistent across same or very highly similar uh, phenotypes. Um, we, we wondered, you know, an initial study by itself, one of the challenges of requiring replication is that some phenotypes, it may be very difficult to, to find uh, additional samples to replicate. You also don't want to hold up, you know, progress. You don't want people to split their samples so that they say, okay, we had a thousand person study, we split it in half, um, and we have 500 and 500, neither of which have, have adequate power. Um, so, and we did recognize that if there were multiple studies that were sort of showing the same thing, that's probably stronger than a single study that split multiple ways. And what do you do with um, particular phenotypes or, or studies that don't have an option for, for replication? Um, one of the examples, I believe it was glioblastoma or one of the childhood leukemias, you know, they, they had all of the cases in the world that were, that were known of in, in one genome-wide association study. Well, you're not going to be able to replicate that. Uh, so there may be other approaches. Um, certainly, uh, we have other tools in the, in the toolbox, as it were. And there was a, a strong feeling that we shouldn't change the standards for definitiveness uh, of the various false discovery or, or replication uh, false positive control rates uh, um, approaches that we've, we've mentioned. Uh, clinical trials were another one where we thought, gee, you know, if you find an association with a, a bad outcome, you don't want to repeat the clinical trial to find the bad outcome. That's really pretty unethical. Um, so uh, I think the bottom line there was don't just rely on genome-wide association. There are lots of uh, other approaches for identifying and understanding associations. And we may need to have different standards for findings of major clinical significance, particularly, you know, if you're, if you're looking at an adverse effect that you really can't try to replicate. We debated a lot whether there should be a, a, you know, a specific number promulgated for a significance level, and everybody agreed no, but in, in general, the, you know, the confidence is better, the, you know, it's higher, the smaller the, the p-value is. Um, and there was general agreement that that range should be pretty broad um, and perhaps a higher threshold for a, a phenotype that's difficult to measure where you might have a lot of noise in the phenotype, so you'd, you'd like to be sure you're not also getting noise in your genome association. Uh, there was a, you know, sort of a beware of the various, very smallest associations. These may well be uh, genotyping error, and in many cases in, in GAIN we found that that was the case. Um, but once you correct for those, you should be all right. Uh, as I mentioned before, if the significance depends on a, a, f a particularly funky analysis method or some strange multiple co uh, comparison correction, beware. Uh, if it depends on the phenotype definition being very, very specific, you know, BMI over 30 versus um, BMI continuous or uh, some other such thing, you know, beware of that finding. Um, what's, what uh, is often done is what's called permutation, randomizing the phenotypes so that, so that in, you, know, just, you just sort of assign a random case control um, um, designation to the same genotyping data and see what, what kinds of spurious or, or uh, uh, known to be random associations you get. That gives you sort of an expected level of, of association, and that's a reasonable approach to take. Um, and probably a, a good warning to use biologic information, sort of our knowledge of pathways and, and that. Um, maybe a priori in coming up with um, hypotheses, but not a posteriori after you already have the data, because you can pretty much, you know, the, the genome and, and the, the human organism is so complex, you can pretty much come up with any story to, to justify any findings. Um, somebody showed a, a picture of Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories and said, you know, this is what, what you end up with. And we've talked before about uh, genotyping quality, and we, we emphasize this uh, in, in the working group, uh, reporting results of known study sample duplicates, of known standard uh, duplicates, replicating a small number of SNPs on another uh, platform, um, and strong caveats regarding the fallibility, fallibility of genotyping. Um, so our criteria, and they're, they're listed there, I won't, I won't read them all over, but uh, the criteria for positive replication in terms of sample size, the same or similar trait, same population, or a very similar one. And it, and it is helpful to sort of expand beyond your population, we'll look at some examples of that, uh, to, to increase sort of your, your confidence in a finding, and also to show that related phenotypes have a similar finding. Um, and you'd like the same model, the same gene, the same SNP, uh, a highly significant association. 
We also thought that, that we should perhaps define a, a meaningful negativity, as it were. Um, so if you really want to say that, a, that you, are not, you have not replicated this finding, it is just not there. Like those four papers I showed you for, uh, for the NSIG2, um, many of the, the characteristics should be similar, but it should be an, an identical trait in an identical population to really claim that you've got no replication. And you should be powered for the appropriate effect size, taking into account this, this potential for the winner's curse. It's unclear how best to do that except to just assume that whatever the initial report is, the true um, magnitude of the odds ratio that you're looking for is going to be less and how much less, you know, you can look at the confidence interval perhaps or, or other uh, approaches. Okay, whoops. Um, and then um, um, the value of replicating studies and samples of different ancestral origin can actually tell you something about what SNPs might be operative because shorter LD blocks in, in other in samples, particularly of recent African ancestry, may sort of disjoin two SNPs that were otherwise traveling together in your initial um, association study. And allele frequency differences may also give you some hints about lack of replication. Um, so, something to be aware of is that um, most everyone now in, in genome-wide association follows this approach of joint analysis of the initial the stage one and stage two uh, studies. This is published by Skoll et al. from, from Benke's group um, about a year ago, uh, two years ago now. Um, and it made a very strong case for not separating out your, your stage one and stage two analyses and analyzing them separately, but actually putting them back together, correcting that for the multiple comparisons problem that it, it adds. It's not, nowhere near the, you know, a million SNP problem. Um, and analyzing them together, and they give some nice estimates of the power that you get with this approach. So it's a useful thing to be aware of. Um, so yeah, stage two data considered alone, and um, uh, so they recommend a joint analysis. So I think I'll, I'll go now into sort of how one maps or narrows an association interval. This is entering the middle. Well, this is just going from bad to worse, uh, the middle of nowhere. So, but hopefully we're somewhere because we're in the genome. Um, so had the flow of investigation from uh, genome-wide association to actual clinical translation is a, is a challenging uh, uh, area. Um, we uh, consider this at, after the initial genome-wide association and replication studies, uh, probably a little bit more replication and fine mapping than moving on to sequencing. Uh, and genotyping in larger cohorts than functional studies to try to understand what the variant actually does. Translational studies, we haven't quite figured out how to do this, and Tom is, Tom is going to explain that all um, in, in Lecture 8, uh, but it is, it is a challenge. It's probably, as with all translation, the toughest thing. So how, how did we used to go about this before we had genome-wide association studies? We you'd tend to take a, uh, an interval, usually an interval of linkage. Uh, this is um, an MI study from Helga Dotter uh, et al. in the Icelandic group, and they found this linkage peak on chromosome 13. Uh, and what you, you often would do is look at sort of your, your top or your, your peak association, say your linkage signal, uh, and then kind of drop down one LOD and, and one LOD score interval and then see where that kind of hits you on your chromosome and uh, little cross here. So, so you're dropping down to 1.5 on either side. Here's your chromosome all lined up and you're basically taking this interval. And that's what they did. It was 13 centimorgans. Um, and what they then did, taking this 13 centimorgans, dropping down, they, they then salted this area with um, uh, a large number of SNPs that, that were not on their original um, um, genotyping platform, and what they had done was a microsatellite uh, study. But these are, are SNPs, actually, and there are lots more of them than there were in the initial study. Um, and shown here are the associations they saw. These were actually testing uh, haplotypes. And so uh, here was the most significant finding. It was actually sex stratified. And there are various uh, markers. So the single markers are shown here in black. And then a two-marker haplotype, because this is a very densely genotyped area, uh, are shown in, in black here, I believe. Uh, Three-marker haplotypes are in blue, et cetera. And, and I think what you can get from this is that everything really is kind of lining up right in this area, and there just happens to be a really good uh, candidate gene here, ALOX5AP. There may have been other areas of the genome that had equally good linkage signals that didn't have good candidates that they didn't pursue. So, so recognizing that false positives and publication bias may be a problem here. Um, and then what they did was, was to take this particular gene, which the exons of which are shown here, and sequence it to try to find uh, other variants that perhaps they were tagging, they didn't realize it was sort of hidden in that region and, and trying to find a, a causative signal, and then went, went forward with uh, uh, some functional studies. But that's, that's basically how, how one would do it in, in the linkage realm. The sequencing is, is an important step because you are looking for something that may not have been uh, identified in a platform previously and might be rare, but might actually be accounting for your signal. Um, and, and what's tended to happen is that many investigators have done this 
in many different regions and sometimes in the same region. And so we're getting a lot of sequencing data out there that doesn't always end up into the, into the com common databases. And we'd very much like to see um, that, you know, the sequencing available um, uh, for the wider scientific community. So because of that, about a year ago, this Thousand Genomes project started. It's called a Deep Catalog of Human Genetic Variation. And what it's designed to do is, was initially in a thousand people, um, sequence each of them in a, in a way that, that essentially you had each, each part of the genome covered at least twice, so sequenced at least twice. The, the way sequencing works is, is that you take a chunk of, the, of DNA and you run through it and then you kind of assemble it, match it all up together. Those chunks can be very long in the, in the early days and very short in the, in the more uh, recent sequencing uh, approaches. Um, <clears throat> but, but basically, to, to finish a, a sequence, to be sure that you're confident in it, you want to go over it like 20 times or so. This is only going over it two times initially, and actually sequencing has, has gotten better, so they're actually going to do four times now, and I'm sure when we meet a year from now, they'll be doing it eight times, but at any rate. Um, and if you want to learn more about this, they, they have a website, the thousandgenomes.org, uh, tells you a little bit more about that. <clears throat> so in, in looking at populations of different ancestry, you can actually learn a fair amount, uh, particularly if you use one that has lower LD um, than, than the population that you started with. Um, and so shown here is uh, eight SNPs uh, in the TCF7L2 region. That's that, that gene that's uh, strongly associated with diabetes. Here are the, the SNPs sort of down the, um, you know, this is the order in which they occur on the chromosome, and then the correlations of them just with their nicknames up on, on top. And what you can see here are the LD, the R squared values between each of them. So, you know, 2906 is associated with, point, uh, with a 20271 and a 0.56 level of, of R squared. Um, so that's, that's in the Icelandic population, shown below the diagonal is in the uh, African population, and you can, it's a little, you can see that there are some lower numbers here than there are up here, which you would expect, because we, we know that African populations have less LD, or shorter blocks of LD than European populations. But you remember our trick of sort of coloring the LD with um, uh, various shades, and if you do that here, it really kind of stands out. Um, but in European populations, you have fairly dense LD, in African populations, you have much less so. And actually, if you were to look in this area, SNP 6992, uh, associated with these three uh, SNPs, if you look at, at that in uh, the African population, 6992, you have much lower LD, essentially none um, in, in these two, in these regions. So basically, you'd be able to, to distinguish between uh, 6992 and these three other SNPs um, in an African population if you were to type all of those. And, and it might give you a hint as to what is, is actually associated with the disease. Recognizing that there's a lot different between African and um, um, West African and Icelandic populations than just their DNA um, in terms of, of environmental factors and other things. But this is a, at least a way with DNA sequence that you can maybe get down to a narrower region. Um, and then looking at uh, uh, other ways of, of kind of trying to figure out, is it just a single SNP within a region or are some of these, these SNPs kind of in, interrelated? Uh, this was done by the, um, the California group, the multi-ethnic cohort, Heyman et al., um, who looked at the 8Q24 region and, and said, you know, we have this actually a, a number of associations, and here are the associations p-values shown here, and this is the chromosome lined up, and here you clearly have two different groups of SNPs. Here's our strongest SNP, and so what we're going to do is adjust all of our associations for this particular SNP, and when they did that, you notice all of these guys kind of fell down to the, to the bottom here, but these remained untouched because they were independent of those. So here was the next strongest SNP, and they adjusted for that, and you notice all, all of these kind of fell down, and here's your next strongest SNP, and they did this actually through about five different steps, and, uh, and suggested that there are at least five regions of 8Q24 that may be independently associated with prostate cancer. So this is another approach for, for sort of parsing out uh, which SNPs are contributing. Wanted to talk a little bit about the CDKN2A and 2B region. Um, so this is the this association shown in coronary disease in McPherson study that was published simultaneously with an Icelandic study, and you can see uh, these two genes. Here's your association signal, and these genes are, are quite nearby. Um, in this diabetes study from the, the Wellcome Trust group, uh, you're now old pros at looking at these. This is a, a D prime plot. Uh, you can see here it's actually D, um, and this is an R squared plot, uh, and, and again, here's your linkage disequilibrium block and the associations that they saw, and there, by golly, are CDKN 2A and 2B, now associated with diabetes. Uh, similar kind of uh, study now from the Icelandic group, again, aortic and intracranial aneurysm, and again, here are these two genes and the linkage blocks. These are areas of recombination, uh, recombination hotspots, they tend to show that way. Um, and a, a nice 
sort of way of showing this again from the Wellcome Trust Group where they, they showed their associations here. These, this is the association region and the, the black points are the, are the SNPs they actually genotype. The gray ones are those that they imputed. Remember I, I mentioned before that sometimes you can use linkage disequilibrium information around a SNP to kind of look at neighboring SNPs and kind of guess what the, the one right next to it is. And, and there are a variety of methods for doing this. We're actually testing them in gain and, and comparing them. Uh, but they did that and, and came up with um, uh, imputed signals as well as, as uh, uh, genotype signals. What they've shown here is, in red, the recombination rate um, across the human genome uh, calculated from HapMap. And you can see that this region is pretty much bounded by these two very um, uh, hot spots of recombination. And this is kind of genetic dis distance um, plotted uh, along the, in this purple line here. So genetic distance is very, very low um, uh, for this region where there's very little recombination. It's much higher as recombination increases. Um, and then they also showed, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, sorry, the, the genes, this is the, the genes in the same region. Um, and the genes in the positive strand are shown here. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, and this is the, the CDKN2A and 2A and 2B. And this is a conservation score. It's basically looking at areas of the genome that are very similar across different genomes, ma mammals and other things. And, and that, I'll give you a better example of that in a second. So this is a way, one of the nice things about DNA being sort of a, a linear molecule is that you can put lots of tracks uh, on it. And when you look at the browsers and things that Tom mentioned to you in, in um, uh, the first lecture, you, you can actually sort of turn these things on and turn them off and get different information uh, about that particular stretch of DNA. Okay, uh, moving on a little bit into functional studies, uh, correlating SNPs with sort of logical intermediate phenotypes. Um, and I'll, I'll look at, uh, at three examples, um, or, or these are at least three examples I can, I can give you of the CDKL1 association with diabetes, um, this association with uh, chromosome 8Q24, which 8Q24 not only associated with lots of cancers, but also type 2 diabetes, but different SNPs. Um, and then there's a non-synonymous arginine to tryptophan change in, in the solid carrier 4 member 8, SLC30A8, which is a diabetes association. Um, and this one in particular is specific to the pancreas and expressed in beta cells. So it was, they were very excited when they found of the various associations in type 2 diabetes, this particular one is, is, is expressed in, in beta cells, and so that's an expression study that's sort of supporting the association. Um, and that first example that I, I mentioned, this, uh, again, was, was from the decode group, and here they show the CDKAL1 uh, association with insulin secretion, because it would make sense if, if you know, your insulin secretion is lower in people with the variants, maybe they're at higher risk for, for diabetes. And they did show in, that, in fact, you had um, associations with these variants um, in all participants, males and females, with lower insulin secretion in the GG variant. Um, similarly, for uh, the, the SLC30A8, it was also associated with insulin secretion, now in a more of a sort of a codominant uh, uh, association that's looking a little bit more recessive. So that's one way that one can, can kind of look at uh, what, what the function of some of these SNPs might be, is to relate them to kind of intermediate phenotypes. Um, this was also done um, by, again, the same group. Um, looking now in a study of, of uh, myocardial infarction, they had implicated this uh, leukotriene B4 um, um, gene in the ALOX 5AP study that I showed just part of the same mechanism. And here they showed that there are actually lower levels of, of um, uh, the uh, LTB4 uh, in, M uh, sorry, higher levels in the MI cases than in the controls, and they made a case for some biologic plausibility of that, and actually showed that their causative uh, haplotype was, actually had much higher levels than, than in the cases than in the controls, which again sort of supported their finding. So the problem with this is that you can find many, many different protein products that might be associated with your gene and, and have the same problem with false positives. But this is one way that people have looked at, at gene function to be able to sort of Im Im implicate um, a uh, a given SNP in, in cause of disease. Another way is to, is to co-localize the gene product in the histopathologic um, findings of, of the particular disease. I'll give you two examples of complement factor H and GAB um, GAB2. Uh, so this is a, a nice example of complement deposition in the affected retina, again from the Klein paper. This particular um, uh, diagram, which I found much better than what ended up in the main paper, this is in the supplementary information. Uh, and what it shows is complement deposition, which is this black stuff, um, in Brooks membrane, which is the uh, part of the retina that is affected by macular degeneration. And you can see that you have it in, in both these cases. Uh, deposition is also in a choroidal artery. So here's the artery that, that feeds um, the retina. And you can see this black deposition here, um, and as well as in the choroidal vein. And here you see it again in another specimen here. 
and then deposition in the Drusen, uh, which is here. And Drusens are, are sort of the, the patho pathognomonic feature in, in the retina um, of uh, uh, macular degeneration. Uh, again, used to be thought to be they're probably not terribly important. Now it really looks like they seem to be, you know, what's related to this disease. Um, and here you have your complement deposition. So when, when CFH came up as, as being this very strong signal in, in macular degeneration, everyone kind of said that can't be. We know that macular degeneration is ischemic. It's not inflammatory, so this must be spurious. And they said, hey, wait, you know, we see the complement is deposited in, in the areas related to macular degeneration. Oh, okay, maybe, you know, maybe it's possible. Uh, and similarly, with, with the GAB2 um, uh, locus that I showed you in APOE4 carriers, uh, what they then showed was the, they looked at dystrophic neurons in brains of people with late, outset, uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, and here's your dystrophic neuron uh, with the arrow, and then the little arrowheads are, are uh, the neurites, and you can see um, uh, co-localization. This is this red stuff is the, the GAB2. Um, and a tangle-containing neuron, which is here, and dystrophic neurons, all of which sort of light up um, with this um, uh, this protein. Um, and then a tangle-bearing neuron, open arrow, which is this guy here, and immunoreactive structures resembling neurons, neurites, and, and so they're also lighting up with this particular protein. Um, and this last one um, is a, a neuron that's really highly dystrophic, uh, a tangle-like inclusion, and it also is lighting up. And, and I don't show you the control um, samples, but they, would, they basically would, would be this background level and not the um, uh, the highlighted uh, area. So all of this is immunoreactive. Again, a suggestion that, that perhaps this is playing a role in the disease, but how it's playing, well, one doesn't know. Uh, one can also look at, at gene conservation and expression. Um, this was done in, in asthma in the ORM DL3, and I'm sorry that these didn't re uh, um, replicate terribly well in your, in your handouts. But basically what, what these authors found, Moffat et al., uh, looking at childhood asthma, found this is part of their association plot. They then expanded this particular area here, and here are the association statistics shown there. Um, and this is, again, something that you're quite familiar with. So, uh, so this particular region, here are the, the strongest associations seen here uh, and the LD plot of, of that particular area. And then they did something that, that was quite novel and, and very clever. They pointed out that, that this area, this is from the UCSC genome browser, and, and you just basically expand on that particular area, and you can see there are a whole bunch of genes here. So, so this is the, the ones that I've, I've listed are shown here. There actually are 19 genes in this region. Um, they had expression information for 14 of them from um, uh, a, a variety of databases. Um, and uh, they also looked at, at conservation information. So these are conservation tracks. All of these places are where humans and chimps are homologous, when you see a, a green uh, thing here. Humans and rhesus are homologous. Uh, this is areas where, where they haven't really been typed. Um, but one can calculate a score for how conserved this region is. That means how, how constant is it across, uh, across species. And you can see that in particular, this this gene really looks pretty good in terms of, of being in that area that's highly conserved, so it may be evolutionarily very important. And then they went and looked at expression and demonstrated that expression was uh, much stronger in, in uh, immune cells, which immune cells are thought to be related to asthma, and so they show uh, that it's, it's indeed expressed in tissues that you'd expect it to be expressed in. Um, but then sort of the, the sine qua non was to, was to relate the various SNPs that they had found associated in the genome-wide study with expression levels of the genes in that area um, and demonstrated, if you just look at the blue lines, uh, a strong association between their SNPs and expression of this ORMDL3 gene um, and the red lines for the controls. Not a lot of difference between cases and controls, but certainly differences by genotypes. Uh, and we're able then to say, we think on the basis of the, ex the expression and the conservation data that it probably is this gene that's, that's doing it. But again, much more research is needed. But at least that's, you know, sort of getting a little bit um, at function. And then in terms of, of knockdown and knockout studies, uh, these are experimental studies where, say, you, you decide the ORMDL3 gene is the one that's really doing, uh, doing the deed. You'd like to see what happens when you remove it um, from an organism. It's hard to do that, and, and that's what a, a knockout model is. And more recently, knockdown of these genes, which is uh, using small interfering RNAs, the, the Nobel Prize was won for a couple of years ago, um, to, to basically interfere with the transcription of an RNA. But what it, what it does is bind to a messenger RNA and prevents it from being, sorry, translated, not transcri transcribed, but translated into a protein. And so you can reduce the expression of that particular gene without having to destroy it in, in uh, embryogenesis, and that you know, often is lethal and it can cause lots of other problems. So I'll give you a couple of examples, knockdown of ATG 16L1, um, GAB2, and MLXIPL in a, in a knockout model. Um, and 
just to, to mention this uh, study, this is Ryu et al. looking at Crohn's disease, and here you see a very strong association. Uh, this was with CARD15, the caspase recruiting domain 15 gene that had been identified actually in family studies, and I'll go through uh, a few slides on that study because it's very interesting. Um, IL23R, interleukin23R was the second most uh, uh, strongly associated region. Both of these were known when Ryu started their study, so they focused on this strongest signal that they found uh, in chromosome 2. But just kind of looking a little bit at, at this CARD15 and how this was initially, oh, sorry, and the, these are the sort of the stats on, on this particular um, very, uh, association in this gene in this region. It was in exon 8, actually, um, and caused a non-synonymous mutation. So, you know, probably this is one that you would certainly want to look at. It may not be the causative variant, but it's certainly one that you want to look at. Um, the CARD15 association was, was really quite interesting. Um, it was also called IBD1 initially because it was, it was identified in family studies. And when uh, you start to identify things in family studies, they would tend to get named for the disease and then uh, a 1 if it was the first one that was found. So BRCA1 was breast cancer, BRCA1 um, and BRCA2. Uh, IBD1 was inflammatory disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease 1, NIDDM1 you've heard of and, and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, IBD1 then uh, eventually was named CARD15. And what they did was, was basically this linkage study, and again, your one law drop, uh, read well, roughly a one law drop. They, they tested, I asked um, uh, Gilles Thomas, who was involved in this, why they only went to here and didn't go all the way out to there, because you can see this goes out quite a ways. And he said, we didn't have the money, so we stopped here. But, <laughs> but at any rate, um, they, they added these particular markers, um, looking in this region for associations, and then found a highly uh, significant association here. And what they did at this point was then to sequence this region and tried to find as many variants as they could. Um, and people said, so this is where sequencing comes in, found all of these different SNPs. Um, and here's the candidate gene right in here. Um, what was neat about this, and, and this is hard to see, but it's, it's really an interesting um, uh, study, was, was in this gene, these are the various parts of this gene, these are the various sequence variants that they found. And what they were able to do was a, uh, basically a functional study, an in vitro study, so you didn't need to knock out each one or change each one of these SNPs in, in, each, um, uh, in an organism. Uh, but they basically showed, they had a functional study for NF-kappa B activation, which is something that happens when bacteria invade. It's thought that um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease is due to an inability to respond appropriately to gut bacteria and that they evoke an inflammatory response that is usually suppressed in most of us, but in people who have this disease, they're unable to suppress it. Part of that lack of suppression is, is not uh, suppressing your NF-kappa B activation, and you can see all of these you know, sort of dark red bars are places where NF-kappa B is, is uh, um, there's um, decreased uh, activation of it. And these particular SNPs that they identified then had um, even stronger activation of it, uh, particularly after stimulation. So it's a complex functional study, and I don't have a, a lot of time to go, to go through it, but I think it gives you a feel for one way that if you can, can identify a functional study and then look at the relationships among all of the different SNPs you found, which SNPs might be uh, particularly Im important, and, and these were thought to be uh, on the basis of this study. Okay. Um, so getting back to Ryu, what they did was they said, okay, we'll give you CARD15, we'll give you interleukin-23, but let's look at, at this uh, chromosome 2 region, and here's a SNP that they found associated at 10 to the minus 8th. It was a non-synonymous amino acid change in exon 8 of the autophagy-related 16 like 1. These genes have very complex names at times, ATG16L1. And what's interesting about autophagy is that it's a process that's involved in degradation of sort of dying cell organelles. It's also kind of part of apoptosis when a cell dies itself. But instead of the whole cell dying right now, it's just trying to get rid of cellular organelles like the ones that encapsulate bacteria that are invading, um, and then try, you try to get rid of those, and it's also involved in the inflammatory response. So it made a lot of sense in terms of Crohn's disease and the reaction to intestinal bacteria. And what they did then was look at, at whether the expression is different in or is higher in immune cells. You would expect it to be if this is an immune response, and indeed it was, so that made sense biologically. Um, and then they tried knocking down uh, the endogenous uh, ATG, but with uh, interference, small interfering RNA. They proved that they could do it. That's all that this shows is that basically um, they, were, they were able to, to knock it down with their interfering, particularly this particular RNA uh, interference. And then they looked at, at whether um, uh, bacteria that were absorbed per cell after this knockdown had occurred, uh, did that decrease? And it did by quite a bit. So, so here you decrease your transcripts by 89%. 
and it also prevents encapsulation, um, also by just by chance, uh, by 89% as well. So, so this is a, a pretty good uh, functional study that suggests that you know this may actually be playing a role in this particular uh, disease. Um, and then, uh, sorry. Uh, so, so this was this is a way of, of looking at um, uh, functional measures, and all of the functional measures are different because obviously cellular functions are different, diseases are different, and, the, and what you might be interested in uh, would differ. So, um, <clears throat> this is a, a similar example now looking at a knockdown of the GAB2 um, protein or gene, sorry that I mentioned earlier in relationship to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and what they show here is here's your control. They knocked down uh, GAB2 siRNA, and there was a 1.73 fold uh, decrease in tau phosphorylation, which is important in the, the um, um, development of Alzheimer's disease without changing total tau. So, phosphorylation, you'd like to have much more of it, um, and, and yet you're not changing the total amount of tau. So, this is just the control here. Again, another functional sort of histopathologic way of looking at this. Um, and then just one knockout um, model, but not doing as much in, mo in knockouts now, even though there are uh, good knockout mouse models of, of nearly, or of many, many genes. Uh, but this one in particular uh, was looking at, at the SREBP gene that had been implicated in um, uh, associations with triglyceride levels as a quantitative trait. Um, and shown here is what happens to your triglycerides when you knock this out in, in a mouse uh, compared to what's called the wild type in, in mice as well. So. Um, sorry, that was a knock-in. So this, this knock-in was, was um, uh, showing that it increases, and a knock-out you'd show that it decreases. Uh, so just to, to sum up then, um, what, life after genome-wide association, you're looking for a putative causal variant. You can narrow the region using fine mapping or sequencing. You can look at the structure of the association region with nearby genes or conservation. Uh, you can look at associations with the protein product. Does it co-localize with histopathologic changes? Is it associated with expression levels? And can you get a, a reasonable phenotype in, in knock-in or knock-out models? And I think that's it.